We'll learn about recurrent neural networks, a type of neural network that's great for processing sequences of data. If you have a sentence, a recurrent neural network could predict the next word in that sentence. We'll do the full forward and backward pass in NumPy, and we'll learn about the theory as well. Let's dive in. All right, so first of all, we're going to read in some data, and I'm going to use the data to show you why we need RNNs. So this is the same data we worked with in the last couple of lessons. So this is just weather data. And let me actually just show you a little bit of the data. So each row in the data is weather from a different day. And it has Tmax, Tmin, and rain. So those are weather observations from the day. And we're trying to predict tomorrow's weather. So tomorrow's temperature given our weather observations. So this data is sequence data. So if we look at the T maxes, we can see that day by day, we have a history of the maximum temperatures. So typically when you're predicting a sequence with a neural network, just a regular neural network, you'll do something like this. You'll turn each element in the sequence into a separate feature. So you'll essentially make one row of data where every sequence element is a different column. So it might be the weather 10 days ago is the first position, weather nine days ago is the second position, and so on. All right. So that's how you would use just a regular dense neural network to make predictions. Now, there are going to be times when you have sequences of different lengths. So let's say we only have weather data for the past six days, and we want to predict tomorrow's weather. So we would only have six elements in our features. And there are other times when we may have more days of data. So we may have 15 days of data. So we may end up with 15 elements in our features. Now, we want to figure out a way to have one neural network process all of these inputs. One way we can do it with a regular neural network is we can add zeros to the end if we have a shorter sequence. And that's something called padding. The problem with padding is it's going to take longer for the network to compute, and the network essentially has to learn the relationships between each sequence element. So if you look at a sequence of temperatures like this, I'll put it in table format so it's a little bit easier to read. Today's temperature is related to tomorrow's temperature, right? So the temperature from January 1st impacts the temperature on January 2nd because they're, they're correlated in some way. Right? The temperature tomorrow is going to generally be close to the temperature today. But if you just feed a network a bunch of values in a sequence without telling them that the values are in a sequence, without the network understanding the sequence, then the network will essentially have to learn that position one and position two are related, position two and position three are related. So it's going to have to relearn that there, it is a sequence at every position, which is pretty inefficient and not very accurate. So to fix this problem, we use RNNs. And here is the compact view of what an RNN looks like. You take in an input from the sequence, so a single number from the sequence, like 64, which is the temperature. You pass it into the input step of the RNN. Then you pass it into the hidden step of the RNN. And this is where the real magic of RNNs happens. And I'll explain this arrow in just a second. And then the hidden step passes it to the output step. So the hidden, hidden step is what we call a recurrent step. And that's what you see this arrow connecting to itself. That is a recurrence. And recurrence basically means that this hidden step is connected to all future hidden steps for the same sequence. So a recurrent neural network can essentially learn relationships between sequence elements without having separate parameters for each item in the sequence. So let me show you just another view of that. That'll make that a little bit easier to understand. All right, so this is an RNN, but it's the expanded view. It's not the compact view. So let's say we have three sequence elements that we wanna feed into our RNN. So temperatures from day zero, day one, and day two, 64, 63, and 62. So we feed each of the temperatures into the input step then from the input step into the hidden step. But the cool thing about the hidden step 
is it will pass the values in two directions. It'll pass the values to the next sequence element and to the output. And the output is where we predict the next element in the sequence. So at T0, we would try to predict the next temperature value. Now, the cool thing about the hidden step is that each hidden step has knowledge of all the previous hidden steps because it's receiving its values. So at H3, hidden step three, it can actually see the values from the earlier hidden steps. And I'll show you exactly how that works in a neural network, but at a really high level, this is the power of a recurrent neural network. It can feed each sequence element both to the output and forward to the next sequence element so that the network builds up a memory of the sequence. For example, what the network might do is take a rolling average of the past few days of temperatures and use that to predict today's temperature. So it's essentially building new features that are made up of past sequence elements, which is really cool. And the, the very cool thing is you can do this without having separate parameters or separate weights and biases for each step. So this input step, this hidden step, and this output step use the same sets of parameters across sequence positions. So let me show you how this works. So this is making a prediction at a, for a single sequence element. So we have our input step where we take in our input temperature, like 64. We multiply that by the input weight, WI. And we end up with XI, which is just the input times the input weights. Then we feed that into our hidden step. And what our hidden step does is it adds together the input and the previous hidden step. So it takes the previous hidden step, it multiplies it by the hidden weights, and then it adds it in with the input. And then it applies a nonlinear activation function on top of that, which gives us XH for this time step. It then feeds XH to the output step where it's multiplied by the output weights. So we really only have three weight matrices, the input, hidden, and output weights. And all of the, the matrices work for every sequence step. So this is called parameter sharing. We say that a recurrent neural network shares its parameters across steps in a sequence. And the very cool thing about this is you can process sequences of any length with an RNN. So it can process a sequence of 10,000 elements, a million elements, however many elements you want, and the sequence lengths can be variable. So you can feed in a sequence with seven elements. You can also feed in a sequence with 10 elements, all to the same RNN, as long as the input data is the same, as long as it's temperatures, if you're training a network to work with temperatures. All right, to make this more clear, I'm going to show you how this looks in code and actually work through an example of doing a forward pass with an RNN. All right. So let's work through an example forward pass of an RNN. All right, so the first thing I'm gonna do is set a random seed. This is just so when I initialize my weight matrices, they get the same initialization every time. A random seed makes sure that random numbers are generated in a fixed order. Kind of ironic, I know, but it, it helps. We're going to initialize our input weights, which is this matrix here, WI. And I'm going to initialize it to be random numbers with the shape one, two. So it'll have one row and two columns. Then I'm going to initialize my hidden weights. And this will be a matrix with two rows and two columns. And then the output weights with two rows and one column. So this is the input weights here, WI. This is the hidden weight here, WH. And this is the output weight. So you can see them all in that diagram. And then I'm going to get the first, I'm, I'm going to get three temperature values from our data. So this will make up a sequence that we can process with our RNN. So data is a pandas data frame. So I'm grabbing the Tmax column, taking the last three values and converting them to a NumPy array. So that's just these three values. So these are the three temperature values that we're going to feed into our network. Okay. So I'll split these apart just so they're a little bit easier to work with. 
and we'll reshape them into separate one by one matrices. It's just easier with neural networks when you work only with matrices and X2. So each of these X values is a different input in our sequence. So we'll take a look at X0. It's just, it's just a single number, but it's, it's a one by one matrix because that just makes it a little bit easier to process. Okay. Now going by this diagram, we're going to calculate X I at time step zero. And that's just multiplying our input X by our input weight. So let's go ahead and do that. I'll calculate X I zero equals X zero times the I weight. So this, this fancy at symbol means matrix multiplication. We use matrix multiplication to multiply our inputs by our weights. If you're not sure what I'm talking about, you should look at some of the previous lessons that I, that I outlined. Okay. So this is just X I zero. So this gives us essentially two features back because we had a one by two input matrix. So we're turning our single input temperature into two features in the input stage. All right, then we're going to apply our hidden weight. So we're essentially going to apply a nonlinear activation function to the combination of our hidden and our input. But in this case, we don't have a hidden state, right? This is time step zero. There's no previous hidden state. So what we're going to do now is calculate XH zero, and we're going to apply our activation just to XI because there's no XH at this time step. Okay. So let's go ahead and say XH zero equals NP dot maximum. This is the ReLU activation function. Again, if you're, if you're not sure what that is, I would check out a couple of the previous lessons. So this is our XH zero. So the ReLU activation function will set any values below zero to zero to create a non-linearity in our network. So this is XH zero. Now we need to calculate XO zero. So that's just XH zero times our output weight. And we can take a look at XO zero. All right. So this would be the prediction from our network for our next sequence element. Now, obviously we just randomly initialize these weights. So this prediction is not going to be accurate. We need to do a backward pass to actually get accurate weights. Okay. But that's our prediction for the first sequence element. So we went through this whole diagram and we ended up up here. The only difference is we did not have a previous hidden state. So we didn't include this piece. All right. Now we'll go through time step one. And we can again calculate our XI by taking X1 and multiplying it by our input weight. So this gives us XI1. All right. Now we're going to calculate XH. So XH is going to be equal XH0 times the H weight. So this is the previous hidden state of the network times the hidden weight. Then to calculate XH1, we need to basically apply the ReLU function on top of XH plus XI1. And then we can take a look at XH1. All right. So that, that's applying this piece right here, our activation on top of XH and XI. We had a previous hidden state, so we do have an XH. And we also have an input, so we add them together. So that's, that's what we're doing here. Then we can go ahead and calculate our output. So we're going to say X O one equals X H one times O weight. And we can look at our X O one. All right. And let's just do the same thing for the next sequence element. This time I'll explain less and just type more, <laughs> but we're basically going to take in our input and multiply it by our input weight. We're going to calculate X H, which is just the previous hidden state times the hidden weight. We're going to calculate XH2, which is just the maximum of zero and XH plus XI2. And then we calculate our output times our output weight. And we can take a look at XO2. Okay. So that's our prediction for the last sequence element. So it's the prediction that comes after our entire sequence. This is what we predict for the next element. 
All right, so we've passed through three sequence elements in our RNN, and we've done th basically a full forward pass across an entire sequence. Now, you may have noticed that our predictions kept getting higher and higher, right? Went from 57 to 124 to 190. That's not great, right? These predictions get less and less accurate as we go through our sequence. And the, the reason for that is the ReLU activation function. So the ReLU activation function doesn't scale the inputs at all, right? It just sets them to zero if they're below zero. And what happens is that the hidden states get bigger and bigger. So you can see as we go through XH0 to XH1 to XH2, the numbers in the hidden state or the memory of the network are just getting larger and larger, which means that our predictions are getting larger and larger because they depend on the hidden state. So the activation function most commonly used in recurrent neural networks is actually the hyperbolic tangent which looks like this. So it's e to the x minus e to the negative x divided by e to the x plus e to the negative x. So when e is negative, this will quickly push the value to be constant. And same thing when it's positive. So I'll show you what the graph of this hyperbolic tangent activation function looks like. So we'll import matplotlib. And then we can go ahead and look at a range of temperatures from negative 10 to 10. And we'll step 0.1. So we'll go negative 10, negative 9.9, .9, et cetera. And we'll go ahead and plot it. So we can plot our temps and then the hyperbolic tangent of our temps. And you can see the hyperbolic tangent quickly goes to 1 or negative 1. So if the input is below 0, there's a small space around zero where the function is not one, but then it quickly goes to one and same thing on the other side. And the, the really good thing about the hyperbolic tangent function is it has a good gradient. So we can do gradient descent really effectively using this function. And just as an aside, if you ever want to do differentiation in Python, so if you don't, if you don't believe that a derivative is correct, you can actually use a library called SymPy to mostly get you there. It doesn't quite present the equations in the, in the prettiest form, but you can use it to differentiate. So we first define a symbol called x, which is just a symbol in an equation, just like up here, we have e to the x. And then what we can do is just write out our equation. So exp is e to the power divided by And then we can actually differentiate this. Okay, so as you can see, this is the derivative of the hyperbolic tangent function. As I said, SymPy doesn't always put derivatives in their fanciest form, but the derivative is actually just this. It's one minus the output of the hyperbolic tangent function squared. Stick my... So that's all it is, which is nice. A lot of activation functions, if you followed along with previous lessons, like sigmoid can be expressed in terms of their output in really nice forms, which is great. Okay, and then we can actually plot out the derivative. And we can see that it gives a nice gradient for gradient descent to follow. Right, it's very steep and it's, it's also curved, so we won't get stuck anywhere in gradient descent. So that's the reason why we use this activation function instead of ReLU, which is what we've learned before. Okay, well, we now know enough to pull everything together and to do a full forward pass. So I won't, I won't type all these out, but we can initialize our input weight, our our hidden weight and our hidden bias. I'm going to scale them just so they range from negative 0.1 to 0.1. And this ensures that our output doesn't get huge over time and our hyperbolic tangent function passes the values through. Okay, and then we'll also initialize a output weight and bias. 
I'm, I'm adding in two bias terms here. I didn't add them before just for clarity, but I'll show you when we add those in. It's easier to write out equations without a bias. It's easier to tell what's going on. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and create a NumPy array called outputs just to store the outputs at each sequence position. I'm going to create a NumPy array called hiddens to store the hiddens at each step. And this is for use in both passing values back and forth and in back propagation, which we'll get through in a bit. We'll set our previous hidden to none, and then we will pull out the sequence that we had before. All right. And then we very commonly write RNN forward and backward passes in terms of a for loop. So we're just going to say for i in range three, three is the length of our sequence. We're first going to get our input x. So that is the sequence element at index i. We're going just going to reshape it into a one by one matrix. Then we calculate xi, which is just i times our input weight. Then we check to see if this is the first item in the sequence or not. If it's the first item in the sequence, we don't have a previous hidden state. So we'll say if previous hidden is none, our xh just equals xi. Otherwise, our xh equals xi plus our previous hidden state times our h weight plus our h bias. So this is where we add in our hidden bias. The bias term just does basically a constant shift of each value. So it, we're just adding it in. Then we apply our nonlinear activation function, in this case, the hyperbolic tangent, and we set our previous hidden to xh. And then we store our hidden for use in backpropagation later. And then we can define our output. So our output is xh times our output weight plus our output bias. And then we can store our output into our outputs array. So this is the same thing we just did manually, step by step up here. It just is in a for loop so that we don't need to write out all of the code. All right, so we can run this and we can check our network outputs. So we can see that the use of the hyperbolic tangent activation function instead of relu makes these values a lot nicer. And we can also look at the hiddens and we can see that they're not going crazy, right? They're staying about the same size over time, which is what we want. Okay, so that's a full forward pass of an RNN. So that is our forward pass. Now it's time to think about our backward pass. And the backward pass of a neural network is when we update the parameters, the weights and biases, to reduce our training error. So we first want to figure out our error. So in this case, we're going to use mean squared error, which is the same thing we used in previous lessons. And we essentially want to figure out how do I need to adjust each of the parameters in my network to reduce error? Now. This is a lot more complicated in an RNN than in a regular neural network, and I'll show you why. So in an RNN, so this last output here, output three, only depends on the previous hidden step, right? H3. So H3 here passes data into output three. So if we're going to find the gradient of H3, we would only need to look at the gradient against output three. So we would need to say, okay, what's the error in this output? Now I can go adjust my parameters based on that. But for the inside steps, so H1 and H2, it's a little bit different. So you can see that H2 passes its output in two directions. So H2 actually affects O2 and O3. So we need to actually use both gradients to adjust the H2 parameters. So a gradient is just the partial derivative of our loss with respect to a parameter. So what we need to figure out is how do I change the weights in, in the H2 step? But when we change the weights in the H2 step, we're changing both output two and output three. So we need to figure out a way to account for that. And I'll show you how to account for that. 
All right, so first we're just gonna grab our mean squared error and mean squared error gradient function. And then let's say these are our actual temperature values. So let's say they're 70, 62, and 65. And then we can create our loss gradient based on our MSC gradient function. If you don't know what the MSC gradient function is, I talked about it in the neural network lesson. All right, so I'm gonna calculate my gradient by taking my actuals and my outputs. So this essentially tells us how much do we need to adjust the output of the neural network to reduce our error. And then we can take a look at our loss gradient. Okay, so this is our gradient at each sequence position, right? Sequence time step zero, time step one, time step two. All right, now we need to figure out the backward pass. And I'm gonna put up a diagram. It's gonna look a little, a little crazy, but I'll talk you through it. Okay, so what I just showed you is our loss. It's our mean squared error. And that gives us our, basically our gradient against our network output. It tells us how much do I need to adjust the output of the network to reduce my loss. Now we can feed that output gradient to calculate our output weight updates. So how much we need to update our output weights. And that's just the input to our output step, which is the output of the hidden step, transposed times the output gradient. Then we need to calculate our gradient with respect to the previous step, the hidden step. So we take our output gradient and we multiply it by the output weights, but transposed. So this is the exact same thing you would do in just a regular feed forward neural network. The exact same way you calculate the weight updates and pass the gradient to the previous layer. The complicated part is here. This is when you calculate the gradient against the hidden weights and pass the gradient down to calculate the gradient versus the input weights. So we need to take the derivative of our hyperbolic tangent function and multiply it by the inputs to this. So the inputs to this are the gradient at the next step, because remember, the current hidden step impacts both the next output and the current output, and really all future outputs, right? So we're going to pull back the gradient from the next step and combine it with the gradient from the output and use that to update our hidden weights and our input weights. And we're also going to pass the gradient from this step to the previous step. All right, this, this seems a little bit crazy now, but it'll get a little bit simpler once I code it up. So let me show you what this looks like. So this time we're going to we're going to loop backwards from our last sequence position to our first sequence position. So we're we're going to keep track of instead the, of the previous hidden state, we're going to keep track of the next hidden state. And we're going to define our gradients. and we'll define our I weight grad. And we'll do zero times five. So this will basically set each of our starting gradients to zero. And we wanna add up our gradients across every sequence position. So we're essentially going to keep adding to these lists to, to create our final gradients. Okay, so we're gonna say for I in range two, so starting in our last sequence position and stepping backwards until the first sequence position, we're going to get our loss gradient, which is just our loss grad at that position reshaped. So you'll remember we had our loss grad up here. So it's just going to grab at each sequence position, basically how far our prediction was from the actual value. All right, then we're going to calculate our output weight gradient, which is just going to be our input to our output step, which is the output of the hidden step at that sequence position, but transposed. So we're going to use numpy.newaxis to transpose this. So it goes from a one by two or one by five or whatever matrix to a two by one or two by five matrix. And that's what we need to do to correctly calculate the gradient. I explained this in the previous neural network lesson. 
if you want to read through that to understand why we transpose. All right, so we're basically taking the input to the output step <laughs> and then multiplying by the gradient to figure out how much we need to adjust each of our output weights. So that's what we're doing at, at this step. That's this part of the diagram, the xht1.t at og. All right, then we're going to calculate the gradient against our bias. And this is just the mean of our loss gradient. The bias is directly added in the forward pass to our output. It's over here. So what we need to do is when we change the bias, it directly changes the network output. So we can just reflect that by taking the mean of our loss gradient. Okay, now we need to find the gradient with respect to the previous layer's output. So that is our loss gradient times the output weight transposed. So this basically tells us my hidden step output some value. How much do I need to adjust those values to reduce error in the output? So that's what this O grad tells us. It's essentially doing this thing right here, where we're passing our values into the previous hidden step. Okay, and then what we'll say if we're starting at the last sequence position, so there is no next hidden state. So we'll say if next hidden is none, h grad equals o grad. So you see in this tan h derivative, we're adding in the gradient that's coming from the output to the gradient coming from the next hidden state. But we can't do that here because there is no next hidden state. If not, what we do is we take our, our, pre, our next gradient, so the gradient from the next hidden state, we multiply it by the hidden weights. Because in the forward pass, when we passed our hidden state to the next layer, the next layer multiplied it by h weight. So we essentially need to undo this multiplication. All right, so we're going to say our h grad equals o grad plus next hidden. So that's the gradient in our next hidden position times h weight dot t. All right, so this gives us our full gradient with respect to the output of the hidden step. But you'll remember in the hidden step, we do the hyperbolic tangent. So we need to undo the hyperbolic tangent. So we'll take our tan h derivative, which is just one minus. This is why we stored our output in the hidden step. So that's our, our the derivative of the hyperbolic tangent function. So we're taking in the forward pass when we stored our hidden value, we're taking this and getting the derivative. So we can essentially undo when we did this tan the hyperbolic tangent. So undo it on the gradient. So then we're going to say our h grad equals np dot multiply h grad and our tan h deriv. Okay. Let me let me go through this again and, and explain it one more time because it, it is it is a lot. This is a pretty complicated. I mean, I wouldn't really expect anyone to get it the first time they hear about it. It takes some time really thinking about how these operations work. So no worries if you're not immediately getting this. It takes a while. Okay, so we're first taking our loss gradient and we're grabbing the gradient corresponding to our sequence position. So in the forward pass, our network output a prediction, we're basically saying how right or wrong was that prediction. Then based on how right or wrong our prediction was, we're adjusting our output weights. So we're saying, okay, how much do I need to adjust my output weights to make my prediction better? And we're adjusting our output bias. Then we're taking the output and we're saying, okay, I took this output in the forward pass from the previous layer, then I multiplied it by the output weight. So we're essentially undoing that. We're reversing the multiplication so that we can pull our gradient down to the hidden step. Then what we're saying is my output in the forward pass was sent in two directions. It was both sent to the next hidden state and to the current output state. So we add together the gradients coming from both sides. We add together the output gradient with the gradient from the next hidden state. But in the next hidden state, 
our wh whatever output we sent was also multiplied by the hidden weight. So we, we basically undo that multiplication so we can pull the gradient across to our current hidden step. Then in the forward pass, we applied our hyperbolic tangent. So we essentially undo that hyperbolic tangent on the gradient. So we get gradient values inside the hyperbolic tangent. Okay. And then at this point, we store our H grad as part of our next hidden state. Okay. And then if I is greater than zero, we are going to update our hidden weight. So that is, that's this piece. We're computing our gradient with respect to our hidden weights. So we're going to say our H weight grad e plus equals hiddens I minus one because the input to our hidden step was the output of the previous hidden layer in the forward pass. And I'm doing, I'm using this np.new axis to basically do a transpose in this case. So it's transposing the hiddens. So in the diagram, you'll see dot T for transpose here. I'm just using a new axis because it takes a little less code in this particular case to, to do that. Okay. So that's the gradient with respect to our hidden weights. Then we can do the same thing with our, our bias. And then we can do the same thing with our inputs. So that's this piece where we're calculating the input weight gradient. So we take our input sequence at this position. So that would just be sequence I and we transpose it and we multiply it by our H grad. Okay. So this gives us how much we need to update each of the parameters in our network to reduce error. I'll go through this, this last piece that I just wrote again. All right. So we have the gradient with respect to the output of our hidden step. That's, that's H grad. Then we're going to pull it across our nonlinear activation function by, by undoing what we did in the forward pass. Then we're going to calculate our gradient against our hidden weights by essentially multiplying the input in the, in the forward pass. So here, let me go back up to my forward pass. This part is, is a little complicated. So I'm going to talk about it in the forward pass. Here's the forward pass. So we took our input X, we multiplied it by W I to get X I X times W I. Then we also took the previous hidden step and we multiplied it by W H to get X H. And then we applied our hyperbolic tangent function over X H plus X I to get the output of our hidden step. So we essentially take the gradient from here and we feed it here and here to calculate the gradients against WH and WI. All right. So this is us calculating the, the gradient against WH. So it's taking the input from the forward pass and multiplying it by the gradient and the input that was multiplied by WH. And this is doing the same thing with the input that was multiplied by WI. Okay. So those are our gradients and we can take a look at the end, to see what we have. So these are the gradients with respect to our, our sequence parameters. Okay. And then the final thing we have to do here is update our parameters using our learning rate. So this is what we did in our previous neural network tutorial. So we essentially just take our gradients, multiply them by the learning rate and subtract them from our original parameters. I won't make you watch me type out each single update, but we can update all of our parameters the same way. And what we end up with is our new sets of input weights hidden weights, et cetera. Okay. So that's a full forward and backward pass of an RNN.
Now that we know how to implement a full forward and backward pass, we can implement a complete recurrent neural network to predict the weather. First, we're gonna to wanna to read in some data. So this data is similar data to what we've used in the last couple of lessons. So we're going to use these three predictors, Tmax, Tmin, and Rain, to predict tomorrow's temperature. We're gonna read the data in and scale it so that it has a mean of zero. And then we're going to split it into three sets, train, test, and validation. And the training set will have about 70% of our data in it. Then we need to write a function called initialize parameters. And this will take in our layer configuration. So our layer configuration will basically dictate how many hidden units are going to be in our recurrent network. So we'll define a list called layers. And then we'll say for i in range one len layer conf. We'll set a random seed because when we initialize our parameters, we want them to initialize to the same values every time, just for reproducibility. And we're going to scale our parameters so they're not too large. And this scaling will essentially divide each of our weights, which will be random numbers from zero to one, by one, it will multiply them by one divided by the square root of our number of hidden units in our layer. So it essentially applies a scaling that makes sure that our weights are not too large. Then we'll initialize our weights as random numbers. So our input weight is going to be from the, the number of units in the previous layer, which is going to be the input layer, will be our number of input features and our number of output features will be our number of hidden units. So this is the number of features at our hidden step. So we'll multiply this by two times K and subtract K. So the weights are between one negative one divided by the square root of our hidden units to one divided by the square root of our hidden units. And we'll do the same thing for our hidden weight and our hidden bias. I'm not gonna make you watch me type these out, just copy them in but our hidden unit works from one sequence position's hidden state to the next sequence position's hidden state. So the input and output of that layer have the same number of features and the bias. Then with our output, we'll initialize from the hidden state to the output. So however many features we wanna output. And then we will append this to our list of layers. Theoretically, this will work if you have multiple recurrent layers in your network. I have not tested it. So let me know if it does not work, but I hope it will work. I've only tested it for one recurrent layer, like we did in our forward and backward pass. Okay, so that's our parameter initialization. And in case you're wondering, our layer configuration will look something like this. It'll look like layer conf equals, it'll just be a list and each layer will be a dictionary. So our first layer is an input layer. We're passing in three features, Tmax, Tmin, and Rain. Our second layer is going to be an RNN with four hidden units and one output unit. So we're gonna take in our three input features, generate four features, and then output a single feature. So that's our layer configuration. Then we need to code up our forward and backward passes. I'm gonna copy and paste the forward pass because we've already written this code. I changed some of the names around and cleaned it up a little, but you probably don't need to watch me type this out twice. So it's gonna loop through each of our recurrent layers, assuming we have multiple. If we only have one, this loop will only run once. Each layer will have its own input weight, hidden weight, and output weight. So it'll extract those from the layer list that we created in our parameter initialization function. It'll create two arrays to store our hidden states and our output. 
So our output will need to calculate loss and our hidden states will need in back propagation. Then we'll calculate our input X, which is just our X, our input values times the input weight. We'll calculate our hidden state. We'll apply our nonlinear activation function. We'll store our hidden state so we can use it later. And then we'll calculate our outputs. And then we will store both uh, for later use. And in case we have multiple layers, we'll only return the output of the last layer for our loss function. We don't need the outputs of, of the intermediate layers of the intermediate recurrent layers. Each recurrent layer has several steps, right? The input hidden and output step. But I'm talking about if we, if we were to have multiple layers of RNN stacked on top of each other, which so far we've only worked with one layer. And I'm only going to use one layer in this example, but I wrote the code to handle two in case, or, or more in case you want to use more. Okay. And here's the backward pass. So we pull our weights out of our layers again. We initialize our hidden to be the hiddens from the forward pass. So hiddens is just the hidden states that we saved in the forward pass. We're going to initialize our gradients to zero so we can accumulate gradients across the sequence positions. Then we're going to loop across every sequence position. We're going to get our output gradient relative to the output of the recurrent network. We're going to calculate our output weight gradient and bias. We're going to push the gradient down to the hidden unit. Then if we're not at the last sequence position, we'll also pull the hidden gradient from the next sequence position back so we can add it to our output gradient. We'll pass them across our nonlinear activation function here. Then we'll store this to use in the previous sequence position. And then if we're not at the first sequence position, we'll update our hidden weights using the input, which was the values from the previous sequence position. Then we'll update our input weight. And then finally, we will use our accumulated gradients to update all of our parameters. And we'll divide our learning rate by the number of sequence positions just to average our gradient out across all of the positions. So this is the exact same thing we just did. It's just written out in a slightly different form. Then what we can do is code a training loop. So this will loop over our whole data set several times. We'll initialize our layers with uh, by calling our initialize parameters function and passing in our layer configuration. You will write a lot of training loops with deep learning. <laughs> Sometimes you'll get tired of writing training loops. I'll define a sequence length and I'll define an epic loss. So sequence length is just the how long of a sequence we want to feed into our RNN. And epic loss is just going to track the loss epic by epic so we can see if it decreases or not. So let's see, for J in range, we're going to loop across our training data. So we're going to loop across our training data and at each position in our training data, we're going to create a new sequence. So, so we're basically starting from every single temperature value and we're getting the next seven days of, of weather. And then we're going to feed this into our network. J to J plus sequence length. So we're getting our sequence, our, our actual sequence values, and then the next values. So that's X and Y. Then we'll call our forward pass. So we'll call forward, pass in our X sequence and our layers. Then we'll calculate our gradient, which is just MSC grad. We'll pass in our actual values, which are our Y values and our, our calculated outputs, which is our prediction. Then we'll update our parameters by calling backward and passing in our sequence X, our learning rate, our gradient, and our hiddens. Then we'll update our epic loss. And every so often, so every 50 epics, 
we're going to print out some info about our validation set. So we will initialize a variable called validation loss, and now we'll loop across the validation set. So we'll define our sequence X, which is just valid X, J to J plus sequence length. So same thing we did with the training set. And we will also grab our targets. So J to J plus sequence length again. Now we don't need the hidden states this time because we are not doing any backward pass on our validation set. So we're just gonna get the outputs and then we will add to our valid loss. And finally, we can print some information about how well our network is doing. So we'll print the epic, we'll print our train loss, which is just our epic loss divided by the length of our training set. And then we can print our validation loss, which is just our valid loss divided by the length of our validation set. All right, so the validation and train loss will start out very high, but as this runs, it should descend and error will decrease as we go through more iterations. So one thing I've noticed is that this eventually will get to the same loss as the PyTorch RNN implementation, but it takes a longer time to get there. So I don't know if the PyTorch RNN is initializing better parameter values or, or something else, but the architecture seems the same. It's just the descent does not seem as efficient with this implementation. And it's gonna take a while to, to descend and we're only printing out every 50 epics. So it takes a while to run through 50 epics and then print again. I skipped ahead a little bit and you can see that the network continues to descend even after a lot of epics. So this, this can take a while to, to get all the way to the minimum or at least local minimum error. Okay, so we've learned a lot in this lesson. We learned about an RNN, how it works, how to implement the forward and backward pass, and we just built a complete implementation. I hope you enjoyed this lesson and please tune in for the next lesson, which is going to be about how to regularize neural networks. So it's about how to make sure that our validation and test loss don't increase, which can happen if you overfit to the training set. All right.